Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Veronica Santiago Lu, and I'm the founder of Word Up Community Bookshop. <laughs> she was waiting for the clapping. <laughs> and I wanna welcome you all to this space. This space is called Recirculation. It is now also an offshoot of Word Up Community Bookshop. And um, this space was founded because one of the Word Up collective members had passed away from COVID in June 2020 and left Word Up in charge of figuring out what to do with his books and records. Um, so this space was you know, pulled together in his honor and the books that are here are largely used books that are circulating, pay what you wish for the community. Uh, if you're, uh, pull, yeah, we also have a selection of new books too from Word Up. In general, any of the proceeds from here benefit Word Up Community Bookshop and our programs as well. Who here has been to Word Up before? Okay. For the, welcome back. <laughs> For those of you who haven't been there, um, it's, a, it's a collectively run space, started about 11 years ago, and all of the people who have been working to build it, our residents are very closely connected to Washington Heights, Inwood, the Bronx, Harlem. Um, it started then as a pop-up, but there was so much community support for the space that we kept getting extensions uh, until we were at the original space for a little over a year. Um, you know, the collective continued to stay together until we were, um, built our new space, uh, which is at the corner of Amsterdam Avenue and 165th Street. I encourage you to visit. You can also check us out on www.wordupbooks.com. Uh, there's a much longer story to the founding of Word Up as a Space. But I, the reason I, we want to tell that story again and again is because it really speaks to you know, this issue that comes up so much in our city of um, what happens when residents in a neighborhood want one thing and when you know, the forces in the rest of the city, developers, real estate, capital, capitalism, um, push for that push and pull that happens. And, you know, gentrification and everything that kind of <laughs> goes from there, neoliberalism, global, you know, all of that um, isn't a conversation that the arts and bookstores in particular and all of that can be exempt from. Um, I think it's on spaces like us to be able to create the kind of space to have the conversation about what happens in a neighborhood when these different forces are at play, what happens to the actual humans, the residents. Um, and that's why it's really wonderful when there's a book, you know, it's really handy for a bookstore when there, there's, a, there's a novel that really lays out uh, those issues and looks at multiple sides of the issue and the perspectives that play out. We have had such conversations at the shop, you know, community conversations about housing, um, but to be able to talk about it through an artwork, I think is, brings another dimension to it. So thank you, Clavis, for allowing us to do that. Now about Clavis, because that's what, who you're all here for. Uh, Clevis Natera was born in the Dominican Republic, migrated to the U.S. at 10 years old, and grew up in New York City. She holds a B.A. from Skidmore College and an M.F.A. from New York University. Her writing has won awards and fellowships from PEN America, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, the Kenyan Reviews, Summer Writers Workshops, and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. She lives with her husband and two children in Montclair, New Jersey. This is her first novel. After a brief reading, Clavis uh, will be in conversation with Angela Breu 
Angela Breu is the founder of Dominican Writers Association, which you should look up. <laughs> Dominican Writers. I'd say that Dominican Writers is one of Word Up's organizational BFFs. So <laughs> we're happy that you're both here today. With that, I will leave this for you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's so good to be here. Um, I got stuck in traffic for an hour and a half. <laughs> Um, so I'm a little sweaty, so anyone who wants to give me a, a hug be forewarned, I'm like a little stinky. <laughs> I'm going to read a little bit um, from the beginning of the book. Um, it's the first chapter. Um, uh, this section is called White Out, Washed Out. The sun of split wooden frames, shattered glass windows, and fractured brownstones woke her. Luz imagined a huge crash, her body hurling toward a windshield or some other kind of hurt. Then, as silence followed, she burrowed deeper into her covers, relieved. It was only moments before her wind chime alarm, before mommy handed her a cup of coffee, and Papi looked on at her so very proud. She left our apartment ready. Today, the biggest day, the day that would set everything in motion. Luz walked out into Nother Park, where she watched a wrecking ball swing back and forth from a crane. She picked up a part of a brick that had skittered out to the sidewalk, noting how close to her own skin tone it was. A color Eusebia, her mother, called Casi Puro Cafecito. Hardly any milk there, she always said, with an edge of concern, finding it impossible to simply use the word black. The crane's neck moved, and the metal rope swung the ball forward, striking again. The noise grew noticeably louder. The wall resisted. But the force of the pressure caused a crater where it hit, and from it, tiny lines extended, like wrinkles. This, the sound that woke her. The cold air was thick with mist. Luz turned away from the noise and rubble, making her way through Nother Park toward the subway, intent on her destination and determined not to be distracted. Her boss, Reina, had texted her late last night. I got news to share, she wrote. Meet me at TSP before work. What's the big news, Luz responded. Reina hadn't texted her back. As Luz reached the stairs down to the subway, the escalating noise made her pause. The wrecking ball had finally broken through the stubborn wall. The fracturing was now complete. Dust rose into the damp air rapidly, then hung softly above the trees. Was Luz upset to witness the beginning of the destruction of her neighborhood? Nope, que va. She was focused on a rare moment of elation. Would today be the day she'd be offered junior partner? Of course it would. Over the last five years, she and her boss had an agreement. The, la the minute the promotion was a go, she'd be the first to know. She pushed forward. Although Luz wasn't upset about the crashing wall, she did worry about her mother. Eusebia often looked onto the old burnt out tenement building and spoke about putting together a community campaign to purchase the grounds for a garden, no less. Luz and her father, Vladimir, remained mute to mommy's inquiries, hiding conspiring smiles behind cupped palms. They both knew how hard it would be to pull that off. The obscene asking price for the shell, over $10 million. They thought it would remain as it had been, abandoned, neglected, unwanted, since they arrived from the Dominican Republic 20 years ago. Who would bother? Plus. Vladimir had cashed out his retirement investments, and Luz had contributed all her savings from the bonuses she'd gotten over the years, all to build Mommy's dream home back in the Dominican Republic. Mommy remained oblivious to their secret scheming. Just last week, Luz and her father poured over the pictures of the terrace overlooking the sea, with the hole in the ground that would soon become an infinity pool. In just a few months, the house would be completed, her parents would return and move back, and Luz would finally be able to live her own life. 
moved to Central Park West, that corner building on 79th Street she'd had her eye on since graduate school, since she graduated law school. It was ironic, really, that now that she was so close to finally leaving the neighborhood, change had reached it instead. A miracle it had taken this long for the gentrification of New York to reach Nother Park, the Lower East Side, Chelsea, Hell's Kitchen, Harlem, Washington Heights, and especially Brooklyn, washed out, white out, everything forever changed. At the firm where she practiced law as a junior associate, she had friends who'd moved into those same neighborhoods, awed at how amazing the space, actual space, was. Friends who just a few years ago would have been too scared to walk, to walk down the street they now lived on. She knew what would happen when the neighborhood changed. Some of it good, some of it not good. Now here they were at the cusp. Below ground, the turbulence of the train entering the station prompted her to hurry on. She put the neighborhood out of her mind. Her future life was waiting. Thank you. It's the first time I hear you read. Yeah? Yeah. Sounds amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Bienvenidos a todos. We're here to celebrate you, Clavis, and celebrate this amazing novel, Neruda on the Park. If you haven't purchased it, I urge you to please purchase it. I made a list before I got here of all the places that have covered your book recently. I think I got most of them. We have, first of all, you and I were at the Montclair Literary Book Festival, and that was your first event yeah. um, since you published the novel, right? So yeah. that was a, a couple of weeks ago in Montclair, New Jersey. But recently, you were also at the Center for Fiction in conversation with another amazing Dominican author, Naima Coster. You were covered by Rumpus, Refinery29. This morning, mm -hmm. we saw the New York Times review. <laughs> Right? You've been in Elle magazine, um, and the following have mentioned you in their book list of must read books this year, right? We have Time magazine, The Today Show, ABC News, Bustle, Hip Latina, Entertainment Weekly, and I noticed that now there's the three Google pages on Clevis Natera. Well, I haven't even, this is breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, I always check that because when I first started Dominican Writers, there were no Google pages, but now we have like 10. Oh, so okay. that's amazing. And you're included, and Angie Cruz, who's here, is included. And, and I'm just so immensely proud. You have no clue. Thank you, Angie. So I just wanted to let everyone know. Um, the heights that your book has reached before publication date, right? Because the official publication date is May 24th. Yeah, it's on Tuesday. So it's all before the official publication date. <laughs> so, all right, let's start talking about this book. Yeah. And I think... Don't make me cry, Angie, okay? No, 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 no. My mom no. is here, my aunt is here. I gotta keep it together. Ellos tan alto, de verte llora. I'm pretty sure, right? I'm pretty sure. No, but I wanted to take a focus with this conversation that I haven't seen in the majority of the conversations that have had, and it's on the strong female characters yeah. in this novel, okay. right? Yeah. You have Luz, you have Elsevia, her mom, you have Luz's boss. Yes, Reina. Right? So that's where we're going to take it. That's, right. where, that's where we're going to talk, all right? So Neruda on the Park centers on Eusebia Guerrero and her daughter Luz. Their relationship is very complicated. Eusebia puts the needs of her daughter and her husband before herself, like most of our matriarchs, right? And we see this codependency between Eusebia and Luz. Was, what was your thought process behind creating this dynamic between the mother and daughter? Uh, well, the first thing I wanted to do when I created the mother and the daughter was to really pay tribute to like the love and, and their um, bond because these are two people that love each other very fiercely. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I wanted to do was to start from this point where these are two people that are deeply invested in each other. Um, I also wanted there to be a little discomfort about the fact that they're so in. In, in so dependent on one another. They're right? so dependent on each other, but also they are, um, 
they're they're yeah they're depending on each other and i think that they also have um like a lot of secrets between the two of them. Mm. Like I think a lot of their bond is based on the fact that they've made assumptions about what each other needs to be happy, but they're not willing to really tell the truth to each other. And then there are things in both of their past that have affected them. And so there's like this rot that I think lies in, in, in the foundation of their relationship, which is really around silence and secrets. And so, um, I kept thinking, like, put these two loving people in a situation that forces them to be truthful, and let's see what happens. Yeah, and we, we see a lot of truths come out, <laughs> and I'm not going to reveal any of them because it gets crazy. Um, does the relationship between the mother and daughter mirror the relationships that you have observed in Dominican households? Um, in some ways, I mean, I think what I love about our culture and especially when it comes to motherhood is that there is still this expectation of sacrifice and love. Um, but in my own family, the mothers are not that subservient, I would say, like the way that, um, Eusebia starts out, like Eusebia doesn't have much of a sense of Self. herself like she's really defined by her love and her caring for other people and so you know I think that one of the my favorite things about Dominican mothers I kept putting on in el sitio you know what I mean like if you have to really like if if you need to be put in your place they will and so for me like that's a very big difference between Eusebia and Luz because Eusebia um, doesn't really have that she doesn't have that kind of um, anger or that ability to push back and just tell Luz, like, wash your own underwear, you know, like do your own laundry. Like she's still doing her, un her, her daughter's laundry at 29 years old. Yeah, but uh, back then I, our matriarchs were brought up like that, right? And they wouldn't complain about it. It just is what it is, right? Being subservient to the husband and to the kids, you give your life away for, to raise this family, right? And you completely yeah. forget about yourself. And that has been the case in a lot of the women in my family, and my mom especially, who raised three kids as a single parent and didn't live her life, start living her life till almost 60s, mm. right? And that's very common, unfortunately. Um, so to see that in the book was wonderful, but also to see the love that it wasn't such a toxic relationship because we also have a very to a lot of toxicity in our um, maternal relationships, right? Yeah. Well, let me just say something. Like I think anything that we talk about, there's no monolith, right? Like I just don't yeah. think that whether it's Dominican moms or American moms that are, you know, not Dominican. <laughs> um, I just don't think that there's any one way that any any parent is, and I think we find a lot of like that diversity and spectrum. Um, because yeah, but I think there is a lot of, I was, I was asked recently for a podcast, like, how do I think motherhood has changed? And I was like, I, I'm going to have to write a book <laughs> to answer that question. Like in my own life, I feel like my own sense of what it means to be a mother has changed radically. And my kids are only like nine and seven, you know? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you with that. So I know I asked you this in the Montclair, but I wanted to bring this up again just for this audience. In your recent chat with Quali Journal's Laura Pegram, who is here. Hi, Laura. Oh, hi, Laura. <laughs> you mentioned <laughs> wanting to tell a concert narrative to the immigrant experience in Neruda. What do you mean by that, and why was that so important to you? Um, you know, I think I've been thinking a lot about like why is it that our immigrant community is constantly under um, hostility and violence and why are we so often I mean especially for those of us that are like black immigrants it is like the danger is like our lives right and so um, one of the things that I landed on is that I think there's like this um, there's an assumption that a lot of people make about immigrant communities and is that we're like temporary people. Mm -hmm. So we just come here to like make a little money and like and our go goals back. are really to like leave yeah. and to <laughs> go back to our birthplace. And like, so for me in this book, I really thought it was very important to, yes, there are some people like Vladimir who is, yeah. you know, Eusebia's husband 
and loses dad and he can't wait él está loco por sacar pie es un policía he's like <laughs> suffering every day so like he just wants to go and he had like this idea that he would come give yeah. his daughter a better life and then go back but Eusebia considers not their park her home I mean in the entire book she never leaves the yeah. park and she you know? has no clue about this house in the yard that no. he's building <laughs> yeah it's a secret between Luz I mean you you heard it in the first um in the first section I read um so for me it was really important to like counter that narrative that we're like here passing through and to really claim the United States as our home in a really clear way because Eusebia is protecting her home when she comes up with this scheme that it's like a crime spree that's going to deter white people from wanting to move and like make it seem like the neighborhood's very dangerous. This is coming, this idea is coming from a place of love. Like she wants to protect her neighborhood. Um, and Luz, like Luz thinks about her, her birthplace because she's also an immigrant. She got here when she was 10 years old. We have that in common. She came when she was nine. I, I wonder why. <laughs> but, but like Luz, you know, Luz, for example, Like, anytime she thinks about her home, it's like, oh, it was really nice to walk through the mountains, you know? Right, but, like, right. she doesn't think about it as, like, any place other than a place she was born. But so New York City is their home for both of them. And so to me, it was really important to make it clear that, like, immigrants are not temporary people. The United States is our home. We deserve to be here. We've earned the right to be here through our sacrifices and through our hard work. Yes. And we don't need to be grateful. We don't need to earn the right to be respected or be safe. And so, you know, when I'm talking about a counter narrative, it's like making it very clear that what needs to happen is like an expansion of what it means to be American, yes. not the other way around, right? Yes. Say it out. Say it loud. Repeat you guys that. can feel free to Repeat clap. Repeat that. <laughs> okay. okay. So there was one character that I really liked, Kuka. Oh, Kuka! Let's talk about Kuka. <laughs> so which reminds me of that song, Kuka, Kukita. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Eusebia's sister, Kuka, goes to DR, right? She's morbidly obese, yes. right? She goes to DR, and she gets everything done. I mean, nada más le faltaba la uña de los pies. Right? So multiple surgeries so that her husband would stop cheating on her. And through Kuka, what were you hoping to express about women and their relationship to body image? Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. You, clap for Angie too. I mean, Angie's bringing it. <laughs> Angie's bringing it with a question. I love you. <laughs> I love this girl. Um, uh, well, a couple of things. I mean, I think that the idea of home, I mean, you just heard me talk very passionately about, like, this character's home. Um, and so I also wanted to explore, like, home through the lens of womanhood. And, like, what happens when you as a woman don't feel at home in your own body? Um, and so for Kuka, like, Kuka gained a lot of weight because of the trauma that she's suffering with a spouse that is unfaithful. And to the point where um, she can't move, like she can't physically move and she can't physically like clean her body. So Eusebia, that's another interdependent and very toxic relationship where Eusebia has to physically clean her sister. Um, and so, you know, this idea of like agency for me is really important. And to see like a woman like Kuka who You know, in one way, Kuka represents for Eusebia anxiety and worry because she's always making some crazy yeah. decisions, you know? Um, like, I'm going to go for a year to a fat camp, and I'm going to lose, like, 100 pounds, and then I'm going to tummy tuck and butt lift and boob implants, you know? So, like, Eusebia is stressed out thinking her sister's going to harm herself, um, while Luz is, like, Kuka is... Luz's fun aunt, like, you know, Kuka is the one that's like, do what you got to do, have fun, you know, have sex, you know, and so I wanted, first of all, to, like, have a character that meant very different things to my two main characters, and to us as readers, like, we could see the pain and the suffering that one part of Kuka's, you know, exposes only to her sister, and then, like, kind of the fun, lightheartedness, um, The other thing that was really important to me with, with 
KUKA's transformation is that I also wanted us as women to think about like what is beauty and like the fact that like we can't really win, right? So it's like you're too thin, that's not good. You're too fat, cut it out. Now we're expected to have like huge butt implants and perky breasts, but still like if you're not white, you're still not the standard. And so it's more for me like to create a space so that like we can talk about like the fact that it's really hard. And so there's a part in the book where Lou says, like we're not gonna win no matter what, so you might as well do whatever you want. Right. Um, and that's what happens with Kuka. Like Kuka wins. She comes back, un modelito. She has like you know the body. Yeah, I was her gonna men, mention that. <laughs> her her men stops cheating on her, you know. <laughs> and so I also wanted her to win. Like I'm like tired of seeing women portrayed as like suffering and like you know. I mean, unfortunately, there's like I think. Because Kuka gained the weight through trauma, I think, um, I think it was a weight that she wasn't carrying, but I also don't believe that Kuka's transformation was about the weight. It was about her feeling good and at home in her own body. And so like by the end of the book, you just see her and her husband like eating. <laughs> and so like we know as readers that Kuka's gonna end up back gaining weight, right? And like that now she feels good in her body. Um, and so for me, it was really kind of looking at, at this idea of like home inside the body and how sometimes like, you, you, like we can be at home in our own bodies no matter how hard we try. I was wondering how she got to the R because she was so big. Yeah? Yeah, that was one question. I was like, how did she get there? I'm glad you're not my editor, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I literally was thinking, I was like, venga acá, esta mujer está gordísima, ¿cómo ella llegó allá? I don't know. I hadn't really thought about that. But. <laughs> There you go. Think about that. Clearly. That's my so, sister right there. Now I, I want the answer to that question. Pero... I'll think about it. I'll think about it. <laughs> so you also write about the foreign opinions around Kuka's decision to alter her body and Eusebia's disapproval because when she comes back, Eusebia is like, is she really happy with herself? And, you know, there's she's really having a hard time accepting that her sister did this because she also went to DR que casi te estaba muriendo, Kuka, yeah. and she had to like stay with her for like a week and make sure that she came out of that dangerous situation so that she could finish her process. And that was very traumatizing for Elsevia. So she, yeah. she wanted to know, had she made the right decision in supporting her sister? Um, yeah, but the root of that, Angie, wasn't so much just being worried about her sister. I think... Eusebia becomes very upset when she sees her sister come back so transformed. Um, also because like these two sisters are very close. Super. And so, you know, like Kuka is waiting for her sister to give her approval for what she's done. Right. And Eusebia can't grant it because she thinks what she has done to herself is violence. And so, you know, that's one part of it. But the other part is that Eusebia loves taking care of people. And now Kuka doesn't need her. So that creates like a crisis. So when you think about like her neighborhood is changing, her daughter is, you know, all of a sudden saying, give me space. And then her, her sister comes back and she's expecting her sister's gonna need her for recovery. And her sister's like, my husband's no, got it. Her sister ten otra cosa. <laughs> Ella está eh, disfrutando ese cuerpecito. Así mismo, con su esposo. Oh, oh. That's what she came back to do. <laughs> Así mismo, ella vino para eso. So I so part of that question was that Osevia disapproves of her sister risking her health to undergo this transformation, and you have Luz essentially saying it's her life, more power to her. Why do you choose to illustrate these two ends of the spectrum in your book, and what do you think says about how women view each other in society? Um, I I think that very often there's pressure for us to. Like, I, I call it kind of like toxic positivity. Like, you know, it's like be happy in your body no matter what, you know? And I think for Luz, like the, Luz's starting point with like Kuka situation, um, it's really like you should ch chase your own bliss. Like what, it doesn't matter how much pain or what, how dangerous it is. Like as long as you're happy, you should do that. And she also understands like 
Because she herself at times feels that pressure. And she um, loose behaves like that in some of her relationships. Like what? She goes for it, you know, like she did with the guy. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, espérate. Yeah. Vamos al pasito, me favor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's Ella very... Ella un poquito acelera. No, I mean, Luz is absolutely, like, uh, like she's fearless with her body. Like, right. Luz is very at home. Even though she sometimes feels pressure, like when it comes to being happy and seeking joy and pleasure through her body, like, she's very yeah. comfortable with that. So, yeah, so I definitely think that. But for me, it was just really important to, like, for each of these two women to, like, come at it from their own perspective, which is, I think, representative of some of the polarities that we have to deal with. Like, any time that you're talking about plastic surgery, and, you know, I know a lot of people now that go to DR for plastic surgery, and it's, um, you know, it used to be Venezuela, but now it's... Or the, Colombia. Or Colombia. Y ahora es, todo el mundo va para Santo Domingo a hacer operaciones. Um, and so for me, it was just really important to think about, like, just to give my readers two perspectives and then to let them kind of think about it. Like, where do you land when you think about a woman's right to pursue happiness and to be at home in her body? And, like, what are the forces behind that? So, like, you know, you have opinions, but then, like, why is it that we even have to have this conversation? Or, like, to have to have um, a stand? Right. Do you have an opinion? I feel like you're not satisfied. No, I, I, I'm, I'm with Luz. You're with Luz? Yeah, oh. do what you wish. Okay. Well, whatever makes you happy. La vida es una. Ooh. Yeah. I Como agree. dice mi mamá. Yeah. <laughs> so... Luz, after getting fired from the law firm, tries to regain her footing and figure out her future. And for a long time, she idolizes her former boss, Reina, who has risen to the top of her career, seemingly at a cost. Without spoilers, what lesson can Reina's character and story offer readers? Um, so I'm not going to tell you what Reina's going through. You're going to have to read the novel. <laughs> I think Reina um, is definitely one of my favorite characters. I nice worked too. in corporate America for over 20 years, and I feel like I met a lot of Reinas. Um, you know, like just women who are just relentless, and they're going to do whatever it takes. And, you know, Reina has this philosophy that it's like based on material wealth, that it's like, you know, kind of the promise of the American dream is that if you work hard and you stay real focused – you're going to achieve this happiness. Yeah, the more you have, the wealthier. And, you know, and, and Reina Successful. lives in, like, a beautiful brownstone. Yes. She has rare art that she has collected from, like, her travels around the world. Um, she, you know, she had decided very early on that this is what success would look like and happiness would look like. So when we meet Reina, she has achieved that concept. And so for Luz, Luz just wants to be Reina. She, like, you know, there's a scene after she's lost her job where she goes to visit her boss. And, you know, her boss is busy working, even though it's the weekend. <laughs> and, you know, Luz is just walking around this house being, like, dazed by all this wealth and, like, thinking, like, I just need to get myself back, like, on the track because this is what happiness looks like. Um, but then, like, very quickly we learn that it's a lot more complicated than that. You know, right. through Reina, through other women in, in like kind of Reina's orbit that all kind of think this way, like we're going to like shatter ceilings, we're going to be CEOs, we're going to band together. And so for Luz, it's more about recognizing that there is, um, there's, there's a lie at the heart of like what corporate America has promised us. And just like you can win if you're a woman inside your body, like we can win as workers in corporate America. <laughs> like no matter how high you rise, you're almost always in the middle. Like how does that work, you know, for most of us? Um, and so I really just wanted my readers to think about like what is the cost of the way that we have to cut ourselves to fit into corporate America? And like what is the cost of giving our health our age, our time, you know, I mean, so much that we have to sacrifice to be at the top or like even at the middle, you know, um, it's to me startling. And the harder I worked and the more I achieved, the more that was expected of me at my job. Mm -hmm. And I kept giving it because it was very intoxicating 
to be successful. And every time that I was a far exceeds, I felt like inflated, you know? And then it was like, oh no, but now like every goal is harder and, and harder to achieve and you have to travel more and you have to like work more hours and you have to do more projects. And so I just want my readers to really think about that. Like what is it that we're willing to cut out of our- what Are you willing to compromise for this? Right. Well, is it a compromise though? Because I don't think a compromise means two people are talking. Oh, like somebody. there's uh, our relationship with work in this country is demand. Somebody's demanding from us, and we have to give it. Yeah. That's why I'm calling it cutting. Like I yeah. think we have yeah. to like continue, continue, continue to shed ourselves in order to fit into that idea of success. And to continue with that question, can you talk about what success means to lose and how that's challenged for? Um, well, at the beginning, Luz, um, you know, her access of, of like what she considers success, it's really clear. Like, first of all, it's making her parents proud. So Luz wants like her mom and her dad to be proud of her. And so, you know, she's given up living in like a better neighborhood in order to like help her parents, you know? And so... That's my sister, too. We can hear you. <laughs> no, I can say, if it's, that's what happens in my family. If I get boring, they're like, but it's okay, I'm like, so like, like, keep it moving. <laughs> I, love, I love that. She smells so good, it's distracting my cousin. He's like, where's the food? <laughs> Um, that happens in the novel too. There's a lot of good food smells, but yeah. So, I mean, for me, it was just like her starting point is kind of like, I want to make my parents proud. I want to achieve a great deal of success so I can make their lives easier and make their sacrifices worthwhile. Um, and then the second side of it is really like this pursuit of like success in a corporate structure. Um, but like uh, on both sides of it, there's like the big secret is that she's deeply depressed. Like she's sad. There's yeah. an emptiness she carries and she's always trying to fill it with like pretty clothes and pretty shoes. And, you know, she's in incredible amount of debt because she lives beyond her means. Um, and all of that she's doing because she's trying to fill this hole inside mm -hmm. of herself with, with like pretty things. Um, and she, she can't do it. So that's why when she loses her job, it also sends her into a tailspin. Well, can I say one thing, though? Because, you know, in Goodreads, where readers put comments, one reader said that this is so, um, like, untrue that Dominican people aren't called Eusebia or Vladimir. And I had to laugh because I was like, you do not know Dominican people, okay? Because I know, like, 10 Eusebias and 10 Vladimirs. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Who else has read the book of your family? Oh, la so esa es tu, tu sobrina. Jasmine. 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 Jasmine, you read the novel? How old are you? Oh, look at that. 10 years old, reading Neruda on the Park. I don't think we want the children reading the book. I should have told my family. I fell on the job. Uh, make sure you review the book wherever you buy it, please. It's super important to review our books, okay? We're going to open it up for questions. Is there anyone in the audience who has a question for Clavis? Arlenis, go ahead. Hi, Arlenis. I'm more interested in... Arlenis, did you do your nails? Are you... Because I... I, <laughs> I, 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 I follow you. Ah, <laughs> oh, my God. Now you know. <laughs> okay, go ahead. What's your question? My question is more about like, your writing process. Okay. For, for um, when it comes to... As a Dominican, right, when you have all these characters, like, I feel like to sit in the table, it's, it's very normal for us to deal with all the voices. But like, when you're writing now and you're giving everyone your space, like, how was that for you? So, like, like, what was the writing like? Like, I'm not sure what I'm yeah. going to ask you, but, like, how was the process? Tell yeah. that story, Clavis. How did I do <laughs> such an amazing job writing yeah. a book? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, well, first of all, it didn't start out being amazing, you know? Like, I... Oh, espérate. I'm being treated like royalty. I wish my husband was here. I'd be like, you got to pick up my stuff. Um, so, you know, I would say that, um, yeah, it took a long time to 
um, to write this book. It took me 15 years to write this book. And you know, when I started writing this book, I was coming to it from like a very hurt place because I had tried to sell another book that didn't do well and I had failed and I had compromised a lot to try to get that book sold and I still wasn't able to sell it. So, you know, when I started working on this book, I started working on it um, like with a pen name and it was just going to be like a sexy book and it was just Luz's perspective. Um, and what I found was that like Eusebia kept like interjecting herself, like the story was always the same story, but in the first version of this book, Eusebia was running around doing all these things. Luz is oblivious. There's just like crimes happening and things are happening in the neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, eventually I realized that Eusebia needed her own perspective and that was really like a turning point for the book. Um, and so, you know, what I would say for you, like just writing advice is that I think, I wouldn't advise for you to think of like a finished book as like the goal. I think like the first goal is just to try to figure out what is the story you're trying to tell. And, um, you know, I like to think, start by writing like each character. Like I have a series of exercises I do, like I'll interview my characters to find out what they like, like what is their desire you know, and, and the more concrete you can make the character's desire, the better it'll be for the story. Um, and then like putting an obstacle in their way, like the obstacle could be internal. It could be like external, their neighborhood. It could be their job. It could be another character. Um, and then have them work through the world, you know, like if they have a goal and they have an obstacle and they're trying to get through that obstacle, then you're gonna have like a story that keeps going. And like start that way, because anytime that I, I think about a book as, as a book, I find it very daunting and paralyzing. But when I just think about a book as like a series of conversations and scenes where like characters are trying to get somewhere and people keep trying to stop them, um, it's just, it's, it's an easier way and a more fun way to do it. Thank you. There you go, anyone else? The young lady in the front. Dalma. Dalma has a great book out right now, um, and it is um, Woman of Endurance. I've only, I've only read the first chapter, and it is like, oh, you have it right there, yay! I was not recognizing you with the face mask, Dalma. No, pero que Dalma es una estrella. I saw her here, and I almost fell off my chair. I was like, I'm so honored that you're here. And Dalma's book, um, I only got through the first chapter because things are crazy, but it is so beautiful. Um, it is so powerful. That first chapter, I couldn't even believe what you did. Um, so I already know I'm in for a tree, so please put Dalma's book on your, on your reading list for the summer. It's wonderful when we can support each other. And I would do anything to support your journey. Um, I haven't read your book, but I, I'm putting myself in your hands. But my question is, my question is, I think every artist, when they start a project, they think they're going in one direction. And the project teaches them something about themselves that they did not understand that's new to them. Did you find that to be a case with you? Once you finished the book, did you find that it was something else that you did not anticipate? Yeah, I'm taking my compliment back. That's really hard. Why are you asking me hard questions, Dalma? I was bothering you up, so you could be like, what's the easiest part of being writing? I would not insult you by asking you an easy question. <laughs> I love that question, actually. I feel like it's a philo philosophical question, so I'll probably get a different answer um, the more I think about it. But I'll start here. Like, I think one of the biggest realizations I made was that, um, you know, I, I thought that in order for me to be successful, I had to, n like, not put myself in the book, that the book should be something... Um, like a lot of the books that I read when I was growing up, um, you know, when I was in graduate school, when I was in college. And like one of the most powerful parts is that I feel like because my agent, PJ, who's here, um, and also like friends, honestly, who, who read the book and saw that it was like flat, that like I, it, it lacked humor. You know, I was like withholding the things that I'm really good at, at life, you know, conflict urgency, you know, like 
propulsion is something that I love in stories, but I didn't put it in mind because I was like, oh, then people are not going to think that it's literary. So this is what I'll say. Like one of the biggest realizations I had is that like I had put a border around myself, right? Like Clavis as an artist and then Clavis as like myself. And the minute that I collapsed the border and I was willing to be fully myself, then the book became beautiful, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Because it's more like me. <laughs> but you know, like, then I also realized that if I, like, if I really am, like, you know, like I'm an activist, right? Like, not for real, but like my, I believe that art should be used to change the world. Um, and so I was like, so like, if I don't believe that like a country should have borders, so it's just an example. Like, this country shouldn't have a border, right? And so what I wanted to do in, in my work then became how can I erase borders between genre? So like how can I make literary fiction into like a thriller so you can put the book down in a romance so there's like all kinds of sexy stuff happening in it and like humorous in a way where like even though the things that are happening are really dark, they're also really funny. Um, and then like at the end on the other side, you end up in this place where it's like you've been traveling through a neighborhood and at the beginning you're like, oh, I know this place. And then by the end, it's like you're transformed because you actually went through a completely different place. And so, you know, I, I'm calling it like reverse gentrification of the mind. This idea that like we're going to collapse the borders between like some genre and we're going to like make literature exciting again and we're going to make it sexy and funny again. Um, and for me, it's a big risk because I was like taught in schools where like excellence was something that was very focused on like word by word and like continuity and elegance. And what I ended up doing with this book was like collapsing some of that, like creating friction so that like when you read it, there are times when you have to stop reading and reread a sentence, yes. you know, where like the reader has to do more work. Yes. Um, and you know, it's a risk because I actually don't know that the book will get me like when I thought about success, like awards and different things. Um, but you know, where I ended up was like this book represents who I am as a person and what I want the world to look like. And I'm proud of that, you know? Yeah. Damn, thank you for that question. I'm gonna have to write that down. <laughs> that was good. I also want to clap it up for Clavy's literary agent. Yeah, clap for BJ Mark! Yay, he's wonderful! <laughs> because it's not that easy to get our stories published. So we appreciate you yeah. for believing in this incredible novel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? So 15 years is a lot of life, right? So I'm just wondering, from your own life experiences, you know, you've had kids, you've gotten married, you've had all these monumental life experiences. Have any of those, did any of those lead to a major turning point in what happened in the story? Yeah. Thank you, Katie. That's one of my best friends. She came from California. Ah! <laughs> Clap it up for Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Clap it up for Katie. Um, I would say, yeah, there were uh, several things. I mean, I would say, like, you know, my, my son Julian went through two bone marrow transplants. Um, and in, during the second bone marrow transplant, my daughter Penelope was his donor. And during the second bone marrow transplant, he, um, his appendicitis burst. And it was very dangerous. And, you know, during the time when, like, I was in the hospital, I was right here in 168th at the Pre Columbia Presbyterian, and we, you know, because he was doing a bone marrow transplant, we lived in the hospital for, like, six to eight weeks. And I remember, like, during, like, that terrible, like, three or four day where they were saying, like, we don't know if he's going to make it. Like, you know, I kept thinking a lot about, like, how I had avoided putting Eusebia in a hospital because she had suffered a trauma, and I was very scared scared that I would get it wrong so I I never wrote like what actually happened to her in her past um, and so like one of the first things I did when you know my son was healed and um, everything turned out okay was that I wrote that scene and did I cry Jesus it was like you know tearing my own heart out but it was like I actually figured out that what was the heart of this book was like really telling the truth about loss and pain and how like if you're honest about loss and pain, you can also find a way through it, right? And so for my character, it was like something that I, 
I wish I hadn't gone through what I went through to realize that it was important to like tell the truth about what the characters are hiding from other people and from themselves because that's the part that's gonna turn the story. And now like that chapter is my favorite chapter. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Um, but I would say like that experience happened like the year before I came back into writing where I was like, this book is gonna get published because there's something in it that I think is important. Um, so I think with that pain and that loss came like this kind of beautiful transformation in my own life, which was like persistence and understanding that like it, the book wasn't gonna be out in the world if I wasn't actively fighting for it. Thank you, Katie, look at that. <laughs> Any more questions? Marilyn, hi. Hi, Marilyn. Everybody here is like my family or yeah. my students. <laughs> I have a question about like your, like your writing process that keeps you on task. Like, do you have any rituals? Are there things that you read? Are there things that you do to get in the mood to write? Um, you know, to balance out your, your family and like other responsibilities? Like, how do you, how do you carve out your writing time and make it, you know, can you tell we have writers in the room? <laughs> I love that question. You know, I mean, I used to be really precious about writing, like, before I had children. Like, you know, I had to, like, have this right light, and I had to have the right candle burning. Um, and now, like, after having children, I'm just not precious at all. Um, I just, you know, I found that even if I only have five minutes to write, um, I'll take them. And um, the one thing that I'll tell you that has worked for me is that um, I really use, like I'm someone that thrives in community as a writer. And so for me, like I have created a lot of spaces for myself to be in community. Um, and like now I'm like further along as an artist where like if somebody says things that are contrary to my intention, I can reject them. Um, so, you know, that's part of like what I think the maturity is required. So you don't end up acting against your own intentions as, because, you know, you might get pressure or, or maybe someone that respects that you respect is telling you to do something that you don't think you want to do. Um, but I, I create, like I'm part of like two writing workshops and then I also have two writing generators cause I'm working on like two revisions of two different books. And so what I do is that I just like accountability. And I'm really good at working through, like, especially now after I got through this book, I realized that you just have a longer runway to make it great. Like, I just, before, I used to think, oh, you have to make it great on your own. Um, and so now, like, I think I'm just, I, I have, like, four different books I'd like to write in, like, the next few years. And so I have two now that I'm almost done revising and, I just work with different people to like be accountable because I think the most important thing is to show up and write. I don't think you can like be precious or like build rituals. Like I'm just at a point in my life where I think it's just more important to get words on a page and then revise them because that's how you're going to get them better. Um, so I just, I just work with people and they read my work and I read theirs and it's like a motivator for me to just get through the next chapter, get through the next revision. And um, I probably have like written more and produced more in the last year than I had in 15 years. Wow. Um, just because like now I found like a way to do it and to like keep the projects different, they're different voices in my head so I can like work in an organized way. Um, but I'm also okay with like leaving it alone. Like I haven't been able to write cause I'm so excited about my book <laughs> being out in the world. Like I tried to write um, this past week and I just, I, I couldn't do it. I was like, so excited. I'm just like, so I'm giving myself a little bit of time now to like enjoy this and putting it out into the world and not be, pre you know, not feel like I'm failing when I'm not constantly working. I think that's, that's another thing that's really important for us as writers. Like I think you have to live and you have to learn certain things about life in order to have anything useful to bring to readers. Could we get a hint about the next book? Oh my God, this book is so good, y'all. It's so good. <laughs> So I'm like torn between two ideas. So I'm just going to tell you the idea that I'm most excited about right now, but that is probably going to change because I really love these two books that I'm working on. So the first one um, is uh, actually the book that I wrote when I was in graduate school. It's called There Are No Men in Claridad, 
And the book, you know, was the book that kind of like almost sold and then it didn't sell. I was very heartbroken. So I didn't think I would ever touch it again. Um, but just like a year ago when it got through the, we got through the copy edits, I just like heard one of the characters. Se llama Xiomara. And I was like, I realized that like, like I had done something wrong with Xiomara's like story. Like the way the book was happening is that like these women all live in a town in the Dominican Republic called Claridad and all the men have left to pursue their fortunes in the United States. They've all come to New York City and the women are left by themselves in this little town and it's like tiny, um, very rural and there's just one priest and all these women. And when we enter the story, it's been one year since the last men left and the women, half the women in the town are pregnant. Bueno. So, so now... Ese na padrecito estaba ocupado. So listen, how, you Los know... Rezo. So like half the women are like, duh, the priest, you know. <laughs> but the other half are like, no, it's a miracle. Because uh -huh. there are miraculous things happening in the town. And so there's like this question about what is really happening in this town. So, you know, it, there's like four women and one child that are telling the story. Um, one of the women is actually one, the only woman who left the town um, to live with her husband. And she's in New York City, and she has been abandoned by her husband. Um, and so she's bearing witness to what the men are actually doing. And she's trying to get back to her daughter, to bring her daughter to the U.S., Um, but when I tell you this book is good, like I just like sometimes I'm like, man, I just can't. I want like to clone myself so yeah, I can like be yeah. working on that other book. I'm sold. Date rápido. I hurry. I hurry. <laughs> Any yeah. more questions? Back there. And the uh, response has been great from your office. It's very horrible. And you stay in angel. We would just Wait, mine's or hers? Hers. And Brian has said it's so nice. Uh, on a more serious note, um, I, like you, came here you very young from VR. Can uh, you speak a little louder? I, like you, also came very young to this country. I'm older than you, but I came in the 60s. Uh, my kids happen to be very successful. You pick something that is very close to you. And it's the fact, how do you navigate when you have success that my children are experiencing? How do you navigate with these two worlds? Because frankly, the pressure comes not only from the white side, as you so nicely pointed out, go get her, and the more success, the better, the Ivy League schools, you know, all that that comes along with it. But also, my kids right now are going to that state, and kids, I mean, one of men and women of in their 40s and 30s, okay? And what I see is they almost resentful because I've been trying to save my culture so desperately because my mother came here also young and was very successful. I come from very powerful Dominican women. I don't have that particular one. My mother was even stronger, and my grandmother was even more so. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very proud of that, and I wanted to pass it on to my daughters, and I have. However, I'm losing that, and I feel like I'm seeing the muchacho que dice se está acabando como el amor y todo como el camino sexto que dice tú sabes algo de mí se va muriendo. And I find I really want to miss because my kids are so much you know, in that world, and I'm desperately trying to save it. How they tell me that they feel more stress from our side, how do you navigate this world? Because I think I feel more stress from theirs. And they tell me that Dominicans expect perfection, that way they keep themselves, you know, they're very relaxed, they dress a particular way. When we meet as a family, they feel that huge pressure of being the hair and peck of the nails have to be done, you know, everything, and that, I don't know how to answer that. And your book is what called my attention as a family, that's exactly what we are experiencing as such, you know? And people see that uh, seven years ago, I would be bragging, you know, like eight years ago, now I keep my mouth shut because most of my relatives are looking like, oh my God, you know, do they even speak it up? Mm -hmm. Can they just speak Spanish? Spanish. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, I was ready, like, oh, bien, you know. Like, now it's like, 
my mom would be saying like, hmm, no pueden llamar. Uh, el pelo lo tiene así, pero tiene un tatuaje. Mm -hmm. Profesional con tatuaje. You know, and I'm getting all this nonsense, mm -hmm. but it's creating a lot of, you know, good and bad, you know? Mm -hmm. And when I say success, mm -hmm. I mean, you have, it's just like the more they have, the, you know, it's, it's like, I don't know if it's white America, I don't know if it's like the world, but it's just the more pinpoint that we were speaking about, it's working and working and working and working. It's just never enough. I mean, I appre thank you for sharing that. Um, I appreciate hearing about that. I mean, I think it's really difficult to preserve culture over time. I mean, I think living in the United States requires a certain level of surrender um, because the expectation generally is assimilation, you know? And yeah. I think that because of that, um, like you're not really accepted un unless you're kind of willing to give it all up. <laughs> you know, what you've brought with you. And so, you know, the first thing I would say is like, I, I mean, I think already like, it sounds like you have like a very loving relationship because you're like aware of these tensions and talking about it. And so to me, that's really the only thing you can do is like create spaces where like the tension and the silence that thrives and hurts like dies, like by talking and by saying like, you know, if, if there's an issue especially around like what we look like, you know? I mean, I'll tell you like, when I first like went natural with my hair, I got a lot of like resistance from, and I did this like, you know, not now everybody's going around with curly do's, you know? But like when I did it, like I, it was maybe 23 years ago and I cut off all my hair. So like in my, in my family, like in my community, people are like, are you gay? Like, what does this mean, you know? And like the bigger my Afro got, the more uncomfortable people got because I started looking real black, you know? And all of a sudden it's like, oh, you're, mm, you know, it's gonna be. But some of that I think comes from love. It's like people don't want you to like face hostility, face violence, right? And so, you know, it's, but I, I persevered and like now a lot of my family and a lot of my aunts and a lot of my sisters like, you know, have stopped straightening their hair. So, Your sister. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but like and some of the same people that were giving me a hard time, you know, are like now doing it and being like, oh, I am beautiful, you know? And so I just think that um, there's just like a large cost um, that you have to just be aware that like some of these things are not ever gonna be resolved. Like we're not gonna be able to resolve tensions between like what it means to look womanly and beautiful, right? And so like part of it is just either like coming to peace that there's gonna be tension or like creating spaces where people can just talk about it and like just put it out there. Um, but I just think like getting comfortable with the discomfort, I think is, is kind of part of like what I would, I would advise. And write that story. I would love to hear about those three Dominican generations. Yeah, yeah. Right? No, no es muy tarde. Sí. First of all, I want to take just one quick moment to thank Veronica and thank the entire Word Up and Recirculation team for having me here. Veronica is so amazing. She like applied for a grant so that I would be paid today. So like, <laughs> so, and that's, that's the stuff you can't make up, right? Like that's the stuff from our communities that it's like, let's just try to like pay artists and it's incredible. And Veronica welcomed me into the Word Up family um, you know, a long time ago, and I'm really grateful that, I, like, that's a place that I consider home. Um, and also Thank Angie you. Abreu, Angela Abreu, who is, you know, just an incredible catalyst. Don't within, make me cry. Uh, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna try. No, I'm not gonna make it. This is a day of joy. But I think, like, you know, Angela has been, like, such an advocate. Angela created Dominican Writers because she saw that a lot of us who were writing in English we're like homeless, you know, because like, you know, the American publishing establishment wanted nothing to do with us. And like then the Dominicans writing in Spanish wanted nothing to do with us. And so she created this space where we could all come together and learn from each other. Um, I've been volunteering now for like maybe four years. Um, and hosting workshops, doing workshops, I'm trying to get you to mentor some writers, but you don't have time. I'd be like, mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> Give them my number. It's I'll all talk right. To them. Just keep <laughs> writing. I need the second book. It's okay. Um, but you know, but I just think like, you know, like a lot of the work that I'm trying to do in like this book is to like pay, like 
to honor and pay homage to like wonderful strong women like Angela because I think the pressure that we feel to always have like the world on our shoulders is breaking a lot of us. And um, I think the antidote to that is to like surround ourselves with other people who love us and help us carry the load. And so I thank you for like helping oh, me carry my load. Thank you. You know how you could really thank me? Put me in your next book. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for, girl. <laughs> I'll, I'll gladly be a character in your next book. Yeah. Well, thank you all Pero for coming. Pero aquí hay un chisme o algo. I, I, I something go, exciting, go okay? Don't exciting. make me boring. Yeah, of course Okay. Not. Never. <laughs> but thank you, everyone, for being here and celebrating Clavy's book. Um, please continue to do so. Please continue to post and reshare everything that she posts on social media that of everyone who is writing about her tell everybody about this book buy extra copies and gift it to your loved ones i got my extra copy today so estoy pensando en quien a quien regalárselo Thank you. A, alguien que aprecie la, la literatura <laughs> que vaya a apreciar ese libro um but yeah let's get to the book signing yeah muchas gracias a todos por venir <laughs>